Welcome back. This is Jesse Nelson with Family Video Studies through the Gospel of John. And I hope that uh, <clears throat> everyone's having a great day today. This is probably my 15th time vi recording this video. So we are going to make sure this is right this time. And uh, <clears throat> so we are recording. And if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to John chapter 3. That's where we are. And in our last video, one of the things that we recognized, one of the things that we did in video number 7 was we looked at Nicodemus and why he was in the Gospel of John in the first place. And if you want to go see that video, you can go to our Facebook page or YouTube page and look for video number seven, and that's where it was. And uh, <clears throat> so I don't want to get into that as much as I want to get into the teachings that uh, Jesus was teaching Nicodemus. And to try to make this video as short as possible, because every time that I record it, it ends up being almost 40 minutes long. I'm going to just give you kind of the synopsis. You can read it. Hopefully we read it with you last time and you read it again. Um, the fact of the matter is Jesus is telling Nicodemus how to enter into the kingdom of God. And he's speaking of a kingdom of God that has not yet come yet. If you go read Mark chapter 9 and verse 1, this is after these events actually. Jesus is telling his disciples that you will not, some of you will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God come. So, though it's not here yet, it was going to come during the time of their um, of those people who were still living. And Matthew chapter twenty four tells us the same thing, verses thirty four, thirty five, and thirty six. But of that day and hour, you know, some of you will not taste death till you see it. And then in Luke chapter 24, verses 44 through following, he tells his disciples he's preparing them for that kingdom. This is after Jesus' death and resurrection. He stays with them for about a period of 40 days. And he says, I want you to go wait in Jerusalem for the power to come on high. And if you go read Mark chapter 9, verse 1, it says, Some of you will not taste death until you see the kingdom of God come with power. And that was speaking of the Holy Spirit coming in Acts chapter 2, because in Acts chapter 1, which is part 2 of um, Luke, he tells his disciples, they say, hey, when is this kingdom coming? He says, you don't need to know. Just go wait in Jerusalem for the Spirit to come on high. And in Acts chapter 2, the Spirit comes and Peter and the rest of the apostles there preach the first sermon in the kingdom of God, which we would call the church age or the Christian dispensation. Okay, And so there's a whole lot there. Once again, we're not getting into some of those studies. But in John chapter 3, Jesus is preparing Nicodemus, especially since he's a Pharisee, who in Luke chapter 7, you can go read around um, uh, 33 all the way to 40-ish, somewhere in that area, maybe, maybe a little later than that. Um, I should have had that looked up. <clears throat> I had it memorized for my last video. Here, I'll actually just give it to you um, Luke chapter 7 okay 29 and 30 so I was right about there and I knew it was in that area but the Pharisees and lawyers rejected God's purpose for themselves not having been baptized by John and so this was something they rejected a teaching rejected they rejected John's baptism now Jesus' baptism that he's preparing them for here is not John's baptism because John's baptism, the one thing, the difference between John's baptism and Jesus' baptism, well, there's a couple things. One, John's baptism was preparing people for Jesus to come. Jesus' baptism, the Christian baptism, as we would call it, is a response to what Jesus has done for us on the cross, okay? And uh, one thing that John lacked, because John's baptism was for the forgiveness of sins, meaning when you were baptized... In John's baptism, you receive the forgiveness of sins, which is the same. Go read Acts chapter 2, 38. Um, it's the same for Christian baptism as well. But the one thing that was different was the promise of the Holy Spirit, which is the seal. That is the promise of every Christian would have the Spirit of God living inside of them and being a temple not made with hands. So, not to get too far ahead of the lesson, when we come to John chapter 3, if you have your Bibles, look at verse 5. Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. There's some debate here. And I think the debate is silly um, only because I never really want to call a position silly. Um, and I don't want to judge hearts or anything like that. But <clears throat> one of the things people try to do here is try to show how this cannot be water baptism. That this is just a baptism of the Spirit um, where, you know, it's almost like a metaphorical symbol um, where the Spirit just kind of washes over you. There's no water involved. And the way they get around that is by saying water was the physical birth, the, you know, amniotic fluid, the amniotic sac that you have there. 
and uh, <clears throat> spirit is the spiritual birth. So physical birth, spiritual birth. But that's not what Jesus is saying. He even goes far to say that I'm not talking about fleshly things here. You must be born of the spirit or born from above. And one of the things I think that would do first, when you make that claim that Jesus is speaking about the amniotic fluid and physical birth, you're doing something that nowhere else is that ever reference to physical birth. You know, water and spirit to enter the kingdom of God, okay? And second thing that you do is you lessen the significance. John emphasizes water so much in the Gospel of John. Just go read it or go to, you know, Bible Gateway and look at the theology behind water in the Gospel of John. What we're going to do here today is actually look at the theology of water going all the way back to Genesis and creation. Okay, and I want to show that this is not just some silly thing that people will believe. And I can't believe people believe that baptism, you know, would be for forgiveness of sins or you water dogs or, you know, you believe water saves you. Well, no, not really. Um, and we're going to explore that here um, in this video. But what I want to do first is just give two examples of how water is connected to life or living water how it is connected to eternal life, and also how it's connected to the Spirit. So if you turn your Bibles over to John chapter 4, this is the woman at the well who Jesus meets, and he sees her and asks for a drink. And she goes, wait a minute, you're a Jew, a man. Why are you asking me, a woman, a Samaritan, for water? And here's Jesus' response to her. Jesus answered and said to her, verse 10, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. See? living water just a chapter before this and if you see in our last video we connected how these are twin stories these are twin accounts of nicodemus and uh the samaritan woman one being high noble birth um you know pharisee should have known better has no understanding does not respond immediately the samaritan woman of low in the sense uh stratus class um, should not have understood these things, should not have accepted Jesus, does re accept Jesus, and but they have very similar aspects to this. Worship, spirit, water, um, read, these thing, read these two side by side and you'll see all the comparisons. That's why, once again, water is not just this amniotic fluid sac. Once again, it would be the only reference ever in the Bible of that, you know, being referenced to that. So... <laughs> Verse, she says in verse 11, she said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with. The well is deep. Where do you get that living water? You're not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us the well and drank of himself and his sons and his cattle? Jesus answered and said to her, verse 13, Everyone who drinks of this water will never thirst again. But whoever drinks of water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I give him will become in him a well of water springing up in eternal life. You see how this water is connected with eternal life. John chapter 7, in verse 37, says, Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood up and cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive the Spirit, was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So, this water, this is what he spoke of, this living water that would be inside of us is the Spirit. Water and Spirit. And that's going to connect in a more in a much deeper way as we go throughout this lesson. Sorry, I know I'm, my the top of my head's being cut off here. Just let me... Let's try not to get all this other stuff in my background. Uh, doing this from home. <clears throat> so, what I want to do right now is I'm going to put up a PowerPoint slide, and I'm going to remove my face from this anyway. And this is a PowerPoint that I did a while ago called The Chaotic Waters of Baptism after listening to a podcast um, from The Bible Project, who actually does a very good job on this. Kind of gave me the idea of that name and that title, but I kind of took it and made it my own and uh, went a whole lot deeper than they did. They spent most of their time in the Old Testament without making a whole lot of the connections in the New Testament as much as I would have preferred. But, so, I'm going to put this up here for a minute. Let me merge this in. Okay, and uh, I'm going to remove my face so you don't have to look at that this entire time. I'm not going to be reading all these verses. 
I'm just going to have this up here. This is going to be your resource for you to be able to use um, whenever you would like. But what I do want to do is um, read some of them, but not all of them. And what I, what I want you to understand is I'm not trying to convince you right now. Here, let me put this up so you can see my face. <laughs> I'm not trying to convince you in a 30-minute video or a 25-minute video you know, to change your mind completely on what you think about baptism. But I do what, you, what I do want you to understand is my claim and our claim, those who claim that baptism, immersion in water, is necessary for salvation, has merit from Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation. And we're not even going to get into Revelation today, but <clears throat> Old New Testament, it's a theology that can fa be found throughout and if, you never, if you've never heard of figural reading, meaning you need to read forward and backward, um, all of the Old Testament is written about Jesus, and all of Jesus is found in the Old Testament, and they help each other. It's kind of like a circle. Um, that's why when Jesus says in John chapter 5 that Moses wrote about me. Well, Jesus, Moses does not specifically actually write about Jesus. And, um, and in Luke chapter 24, the two men on the road to Emmaus they, um, it's the, after Jesus has died, they're like, wow, you know, Jesus of our savior is dead. We might as well go back home. And Jesus appears to them and he teaches them from Moses and all of Moses to the prophets, including every prophet speaking about Jesus. And so every story in the old Testament has a symbol or some kind of type or shadow. It is a reference to Christ. And you can go read the book of Luke to see a lot of the Old Testament references that Jesus uses to himself. So that's what we're going to do here as well. I'm going to make myself disappear. And so I hope you can follow along. First, we want to look at God's use of water in the Torah. Oops, it's on play mode. I'm going to have to do this and uh, control it myself. So God's use of water in the Torah. First, you go all the way back to creation itself in Genesis chapter 1. And I know this may seem like um, a stretch, but it's it's extremely important to see these kinds of things, okay? Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. And so there's this water and spirit from the very first page of the bible the very you know the second verse in our bibles has this concept of this surface of the deep there's water over it chaotic waters is what some would say some of your waste you know over the emptiness um and over or i mean over the surface of the waters and the spirit of god was there okay and the prophets play off this in later writings about this same idea and then from this spirit and water life is created okay Life is created out of the spirit and water being there together and life comes forth, okay? Then you have the flood. How does God cleanse during the time of Noah? Um, how does God cleanse the earth? He cleanses the earth with water, okay? And Peter picks up on this and says, look at that event that happened there. In the same way Noah was saved through water and through the ark, baptism now saves you not the removal of dirt from flesh it's not the physical water that saves us but it's an appeal to god for a clean conscience through the resurrection of jesus christ so it only works because of what jesus did god induced the power in baptism not man so that's why it's not a work of man it's not a work of merit it is a work of trust and a work of faith in the promises of god okay same thing with the flood you know when noah built the ark <clears throat> Now you look at the crossing of the Red Sea um, in Egypt. You know, they're coming out of Egypt and Moses Moses raises the water and they walk through on dry ground and it's, they're saved through the water. And the water actually cleanses the Egyptian army and kills them and destroys them. And then the cloud is hovering over them. So they're covered on all sides of water. And Paul picks up on this and says that all who were baptized through the cloud. Okay, so there's this... In the Spirit of God, right? The Spirit of God was in the cloud. Um, it was the smoke. It was the cloud. And they were baptized through the cloud, which is made of water, by the way. So there's this same concept, spirit and water, going on. The rock, which Moses struck and water came forth, in that same 
passage, Paul talks about the rock was Christ, which forms all of living water coming out of Christ. And so when Jesus says, I am the well of living water, <clears throat> when you ask of me a water, I give it to you. And this, in John 7, he says, I was speaking of the Spirit. So water and Spirit, once again, connected. You can go read the Jordan, where they crossed the Jordan the same way. And also into the Promised Land is speaking of being flowing with uh, living water. Okay. <clears throat> Second. God's use of water for purification and cleansing. The priests were washing in the basins. And I'm going to put my face up here again for a second. Okay, so you have the tabernacle, right? And when they were in the wilderness, there was this tent. Okay, the tent. And then there was an inner tent. Outer tent, inner tent. The inner tent was the holy place and the most holy place put together. Okay, just think of a little thing with a divided room. And the priests, the way they got in there was first they went into the outer tent. They came into the entrance. Then they went into the, well, this is mirror. It would be over here. But um, they would have to offer their sacrifice, okay? Then they'd have to wash at the basin, right? Water, wash the basin, wash all the dirt and cleanse the blood and all that stuff. And then go into the holy place, which as priests is where they served. Table of showbread, the offer of incense, you know, lighting of the candles, all those kind of things. And then in there was also the holy place, which only the high priest could go into. In Hebrews 9 picks up on this and says all of those things, all of those items were shadows of New Testament things, okay? Everything, every item was a shadow. And we can easily say what was the sacrifice that they had to go through. The sacrifice is Jesus, right? You can't go any further into this temple unless Jesus does not, is Jesus is not sacrificed. The basin is the washing of the water, baptism. I mean, that's so easy to, to put that into all the other teachings that we're going to talk about. And then you're in the holy place, which you become a priest. The holy place is the church. It is where the, you know, we are, we are priests. We are ministering in the, in the temple daily and we are now the temple. So we are a, basically a living walking temple and the most holy place is heaven. But uh, anyway, I just kind of want to give you the signs. So, all right. Another one is Naaman dipping seven times in the Jordan. Okay, I just want to show, I want to show this as an example only because of Naaman's response and the servant's response and all these things. So Naaman has leprosy. Okay, and he's a, he's a foreigner, by the way. And he comes to the prophet of God and he sends a servant and says, what do I need to do to get rid of this leprosy? I know your God can do it. I've heard of miracles before, you know, all this kind of stuff. And, you know, um, the prophet just sends out a servant and says, just go dip in the, in the Jordan seven times. And Naaman's upset. I mean, he is mad. I thought you were going to come out here and do some great work or do some great thing and make it a big spectacle. And so Naaman goes to walk away. He's like, I've got rivers back in Jordan. I've got rivers back home that are nicer than the Jordan. That's a dirty, nasty river. And, and his servant goes... So if he would have asked you to do some great thing, wouldn't you have done it? Like, what's the big deal? And Naaman kind of comes to his senses, and he goes and he dips in the Jordan seven times, and on the seventh time, he's healed from his leprosy. Question, did water cleanse Naaman? Absolutely not. It was his following the directions of God, the only reason it worked. If he would have dipped in the Jordan any other day, seven times, it would not have worked. It only worked because God put power there in his obedience to what God has asked, okay? So just once again, water, cleansing, purification, all those kind of things happen. God's use of water for life. God is the source of life giving water, Jeremiah 2.13. Um, the story of Jonah. Jonah is saved in the water, in the deep depth of the water. And Isaiah 12, 1 through 3, I actually want to read that because uh, it's really, it's just kind of a powerful image um, within itself. In verse 1, it says, Then you will say on that day, I will give thanks to you, O God, for although you were angry with me, your anger is turned away, and you comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid, for the Lord God is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. Therefore, you will joyously draw water from the springs of salvation. And in that day, you will say, Give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. All right, that's verse 4. I should have put a verse 4 in there. Water, salvation, calling on his name. Keep that re remind. Keep that in the back of your mind. We'll actually get into that here in a second. Okay. So when Jesus comes on the scene, as we see, first I want to deal with John's baptism first in Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. 
John baptized for the remission of sin. And for a moment, people are like, well, baptism is not in water. Well, John's baptism is immersion in water. Jesus was baptized in water. The Spirit of God came on Jesus at his baptism. The Spirit of God comes and descends like a dove on Jesus at his baptism. Okay, that's extremely significant because our baptism is representative of Jesus' baptism. The same thing that happened to Jesus happens to us. Okay, and then you have Jesus' teaching on baptism. You must be born of water and of spirit. All right, and we already read John chapter 7. This water that I'm talking about is the spirit. So the spirit is the most important thing, but at the water is where you receive the spirit. Um, and we'll get there in a minute. And then Jesus' final commission to his disciples, John 28, or Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You know what? They took that directive and they took it serious. For those who think it's just baptism in the Holy Spirit, throughout all the book of Acts, guess what they're doing? They're baptizing people in water. Not to join a church, not to show that they've been saved, but is for the forgiveness of sins. Okay? And we're going to look at that here in a second. So, Acts chapter 2, let's start here. And we're going to read um, most of these or quote most of these, but I just want to um, you guys to have a chance to look at these. Acts chapter 2, this is after Peter gives his sermon, the first sermon, that, hey, this Lord, um, who God raised and exalted the right hand of God, having received from Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, which has poured forth, forth which you both see and hear, he has made him both Lord and Christ, whom Jesus, whom you crucified, okay? Verse 37. Now, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart. They were repentative, okay? They were saddened. They believed now. And said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, apostles Brethren, what shall we do? What, what can we do now? What do we need to do? Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Um... In verse 41, so then those who received his word were baptized, and that day were added about 3,000 souls. Those who had received the word were baptized and were added 3,000 souls. Um, and go down to verse 47, praising God, having favor with all people, and the Lord was adding to the number day by day those who were being saved. You've got to connect adding with baptism, with the, removal, with the gift of the Holy Spirit, and water. It's got to all be there together. Um we see responding to the preaching of Jesus, Acts chapter 8. It's powerful. Philip is going to the Philippian eunuch, and he's reading from Isaiah the scroll. And uh, Philip asks, hey, do you know what you're reading? And he goes, how can I unless someone explains it to me? And it says, from that scripture. Verse 34, the eunuch answered Philip and said, please tell me of whom does the prophet say this, of himself or of somebody else? And he's reading Isaiah 53. Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. And as they went along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? So in Philip preaching Jesus, he also had to preach baptism for the eunuch to say, look, there's water. What stops me from being baptized? Wait a minute. Philip was preaching Jesus to him. What about preaching Jesus led him to baptism? Well, go look at all Jesus' teaching on baptism. And Je Jesus says, water and spirit to enter into the kingdom of God. Right? He who believes and is baptized will be saved. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You know, for those who think it's a bunch of hogwash, that people believe in water baptism, you know, that water saves, that's, that's the hogwash. We don't believe that water saves. We believe that trust and faith in God saves. I don't save myself. I don't merit my salvation. I don't earn my salvation. I don't work for my salvation. I follow God. And if he asked me to pray a prayer, I would do it. If he asked me to, you know, just um, stand out of my head and spin three times, I'd do it. And it still would not be me saving myself, just like Naaman was not saving himself or cleansing himself of leprosy. But he had to access the mercy and the grace of God by following what God asked him to do. And that's the same thing that we do. Acts 22 and verse 16. This is an account of Paul on the road to Damascus. He meets Jesus. And he's blinded, right? And he calls him Lord. He now believes that Jesus is Lord. But for three days, he's blind. He doesn't eat. And Ananias comes to him <clears throat> and starts talking to him and preaching the message to him. 
And verse 15, it says, For you will be a witness for him and to all men of what you've seen and heard. You will be a witness. You're not yet. Why do you delay? What stops you? Get up and be baptized. Wash away your sins, calling on his name. How do you call on the name of the Lord? In baptism, through baptism. Um, 1 Peter 3.21 says it a little differently. Um, but this way, baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt from flesh, but an appeal to God. You could literally say, to call on God to clean your conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Acts 19 talks about you have to be baptized even for the right reason, right? Because they were still being baptized in John's baptism after Jesus' resurrection. And uh, Paul comes up to some, <clears throat> to some disciples and said, Hey, did you receive the Spirit at your baptism when you believed? We haven't heard there is a spirit. We are only heard of the baptism of John. And so he went and baptized them again. Why? Because this baptism is where you receive the spirit. And then he goes and lays hands on him to give them the miraculous of the Holy Spirit. Do not mistake the miraculous gift of the Holy Spirit and the laying on of hands of the apostles for a person to do miracles and the gift of salvation, the Holy Spirit. For right? Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13, it says, You who believe... You know, in this, in the gospel, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit as a seal, as a down payment of your salvation, as a pledge, I think the New American Standard says. And so there is the gift of the Holy Spirit that allowed them to do miracles. But in Acts 2.38, the gift of the Holy Spirit is salvation, which John 7 says, this gift of living water that I'm telling you, that it leads to eternal life is the Spirit of God. And it's at our water baptism where we receive that Spirit. Um, Romans 6 says, it's where we are, this is what teaching on baptism in the Bible. Go read these, Romans 6, all of it. I mean, it's just beautiful. Um, <clears throat> Shall we sin so that grace may abound? May it never be. How, to, how can you who died, here, let me get there so I'm not recording it. May it never be, how shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ have been baptized into his death? Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united to him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Do you see this? We are to imitate what Jesus did. His death, burial, and resurrection. I'm going to put my face up here for a second. You know, he died, was buried, and was raised. And at baptism, we die under the water and are raised up to walk in newness of life. And that's exactly what Paul says here in Romans chapter 6. And he goes on in verse 17. He says, But thanks be to God, though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart. See, a lot of people want to take obedience out, and it's a work of salvation, or it's a work to earn and merit and they confuse what Paul is saying in Romans 4 about trying to earn your salvation through keeping the law. And you just go to God and say, look, I've been a good boy. You need to save me. That's that's not what Paul is talking about here. Because Paul was the same one who penned Romans 4 a little bit later, earlier. And now in Romans 6, he says, you have become obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you're committing, having been freed from sin. He says obedience from the heart to that form or that pattern of teaching. The pattern he just gave back in verses 1 through 7 of baptism being buried with Christ is what set you free. And don't think for a moment Paul thought this was us earning it, because in verse 23 of Romans 6, he says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul did not think for a moment, because you have been baptized into Christ, you have been obedient from the heart, that pattern of teaching, that it was anything less than a free gift still from God. Okay, so I'm going to turn myself off again here for a second so you can see all of this. 1 Peter 3, 21 through 22, it's where we clear our conscience. We've already described that. It's where we call on the name of the Lord. Go back to Isaiah chapter 12, verses 1 through 4, right? Where he says, you will drink joyously from the living water, the, the waters of salvation. And in that day, you will call on his name. You see the connection. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I'm going to read this. <clears throat> and then I'm going to read uh, Colossians 2. And we are just about done. So hang in there with me. I know I'm at the 30 minute mark again. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 12. For even as the body is one and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body. You see the connection of baptism and Spirit, water and Spirit? John chapter 3. 
whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, we were all made to drink of one spirit. <clears throat> that is where we received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay, you see the connection. And then in Colossians chapter 2, if you think for a moment this is a work of man that saves you, Paul's going to deny all those claims in Colossians chapter 2. Okay, so Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. For in him, Christ, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Basically, he is God in flesh completely, 100%. And in him you have been made complete, and he is head over and rule over all authority. Kind of sounds like Matthew 28, right? Rule and head over all authority. We'll see this connection here. And in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, which is the promise Moses made in Deuteronomy about this coming age, that this would not be a circumcision of flesh, meaning removing of flesh, right? So Peter says in 1 Peter 3.21, it's not the removal of dirt from flesh, Um without hands in the removal of the body of the flesh by circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith. There it is. Faith is what saves here. The faith in this entrusting God is what saves. Look at this. Raised up with him, with Christ, right? Earlier in Colossians 1 and also in Ephesians, he says, the same power that rose Jesus from the dead is what will raise you from the dead. And here he says, this is where we do it. This is where we contact it. This is where we, this is where we are raised from the dead in our baptism, in the working of God. Baptism, faith, working of God. Who raised him from the dead? Do you see this? This act does not save you. You are not saving yourself in baptism. God is the one at work. God is the one doing all the work. You're just getting wet in trusting and hoping that God is saving you, like Naaman, <laughs> that seven time, hoping and trusting that God would keep his word. And it is a work of God. He says, when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions. Sounds a whole lot like Romans 6 says about baptism as well. Having canceled out the certificate of debt, <clears throat> debt verse 14, consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us. He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. It only has power because of what Jesus did on the cross and being raised from the dead. That's the teaching on baptism in the Bible. And there's a lot more. I just picked some of the more powerful ones. There's so much more we could have talked about. And finally, I want to end with this statement. Water is not the source of salvation. I want you to be clear. I want to be clear. Water is not the source of salvation. It never has and it never will be. Water is the means by which God chooses to use to extend his grace and mercy to those who entrust him. Just the way, the same way, back where the Spirit was hovering over the faces of water in Genesis and out of that came life, the Spirit hovers over our baptism. And when we submit to that, just like Jesus, when he received the Spirit of baptism, we receive the Spirit of baptism. Do you see how theologically this all makes sense and it all lines up and it's consistent? It's a consistent theology. Never has God asked us to do something, you know, that really is not necessary, not essential. But all the verses that I read are, are pretty well telling you it's where you clean your conscience, remove sin, call on his name. It's where you receive the spirit. I mean, all these things that happen and people just dismiss it because they can't get over that they, they see it as a work of merit. It is absolutely 100% not. Baptism is not the act of saving oneself. It's an act of humility that brings a person into the contact with the blood of Jesus Christ, allowing God to do the saving, trusting that his word is true. And with that, I'm going to end. I love you. God bless. If you have any questions, comments, you know, you disagree, please reach out. Don't start a big debate thread on the, <clears throat> you know, in the Facebook thing. Send me a private message. And if there is some public discussion that will be healthy, we can have it there. Love you. Have a great day.